Thank you very much, Sister Lowe. And let me say good evening again to everyone. It's a pleasure of mine to be able to engage you again tonight as we study the Word of God. We are in session five. I, I hope I know that you are becoming more zealous in your commitment to Bible study, and that you're grasping some of the important um, principles of theological interpretation because. My hope is that as we go through these sessions, that you will get a better understanding of how you approach the study of the word, and that your, your reading of the word becomes a deeper experience that you seek to understand the word of the Lord and you apply the principles that will help to enlighten you and make that understanding even clearer. In the research study conducted by Life Bay Research, 2020, that's last year, it was discovered that 75% of evangelical leaders believe that Matthew 24 is referring to events that will take place in the future. So this gives you a, an understanding, as I, I tried to indicate earlier, why this is such a prevalent view. Because if you have such a large percentage of evangelical teachers, pastors, who interpret Matthew 24 from the premillennial perspective, you would begin to understand that that is why it's going to be so dominant of you, because most of the pastors then will be passing on those views to the people that they teach. And interestingly enough, the larger percentage of those believe that those signs that are given are going to be actually fulfilled in the future. And a large percent of them believe that the one related to the love of many growing coal and the rise of false prophets, I think it's about 83%, believe that the rise of false prophets and the love of many growing coal are specific prophecies related to time which is signs coming in the future. They believe, about 50% of them believe that Christ's return is going to be very much connected to the Jewish experience. They believe that when the Jews get to a place where they are ready to receive the Messiah on, on a national state level, that that is going to in the coming of Christ, which means that what they're thinking is that the return of Christ will pretty much depend on how the Jews respond to the gospel. And that interpretation comes from a statement which was made by Jesus when he was in the temple and he said to them as he was leaving that they're not going to see him again until they say, Blessed is he that cometh. In the name of the Lord. So they interpret that to mean that this is a, a future experience which the Jews will undergo as they open up to receiving the gospel. And that's precisely what Christ is referring to. But I will explain that a little later to show you the importance of, of context and to show you the importance of understanding um, history and also understanding Old Testament expressions because it's very important that we get a clear understanding because we in the 21st century very often interpret things as we see them and to our understanding. But a lot of the statements that Jesus made were well understood by the Jewish people because they were seeing some of these statements identified in the Testament. So we're going to continue on our study of Matthew chapter 24 as we would have identified the specific prophecies that Jesus made we have recognized that there were local prophecies. He was speaking specifically to the people of Judea. He was speaking specifically to the generation that would exist at the time when those prophecies would be fulfilled and the things would come to pass. And we saw that from a number of statements which he made. Like those who are in Judea should flee to the mountains when they see Jerusalem being surrounded. Those who are in the house of should not come down those or in the field should not return. So he was speaking specifically to the 
that group of people, and specifically to that generation. So it was not a, a global prophecy that he was making. He was making prophecies in specific reference to those people. What I said we would do tonight is to see how these prophecies were fulfilled in the time that Jesus had predicted it would be fulfilled. Because it's important that people understand that. You know, I'm not saying that we could not see parallel things happening when we compare the prophecies that Jesus made in specific reference to the people of Judea and what we perhaps see happening in our world today. I guess the reason why the premillennial view is such a popular view is because they tend to link what is happening in, in world events. They, they follow the new cycle and they try very much to connect what is happening in that cycle with the predictions that Jesus made because they see them as things happening in the future. And perhaps that is where the error could be made. Yes, we realize that in our time, we see wars and rumors of wars. As a matter of fact, from what they said, the First World War in 1914 and 1918, the Second World War in 1945, the premillennialists were always then making connections, to events happening to link them to what Jesus had prophesied in Matthew chapter 24. They checked for wars, and we obviously had a number of wars. They checked for diseases and Famine, and we had a number of them. We had the Spanish flu, we had that killed over 50 million people. That was a very serious pandemic. We had a plague in England, we, we have had a number of diseases that have come um, up in our generation. And we now are even dealing with COVID, which has killed over a million people already. So, yes, we can connect some of these events. And we can see that, that Israel is in constant conflict with Arab nations. And we can see a whole lot of things which would seem to be pointing to what Jesus said as relevant to our times. We see earthquakes in, in diverse places. We see um, an increase in a lot of activity that would make us inclined to think that this is perhaps what Jesus was saying. Even had a song that used to be sung many years ago. Signs of the times are everywhere, and there's a brand new feeling in the air. So turn your eyes onto the eastern skies, lift up your head. Redemption draweth night. So they were quoting from the passage in Luke, and they were recognizing even in that song that they were saying the signs of the times are everywhere. If that is indeed true, and that these things are relevant to our times, and that Jesus was specifically making the, the prophecy in Matthew chapter 24 in relation to our times, then if we were analyzing it from way back in 1914, and then as I said, when the, the Jews became, um, when Israel became a state again in 1948, and when they started to take back some of the territory that the Arabs held in, in 1967. Then if what Jesus is saying, the generation will see the signs, then it means that we should have been seeing the, the coming of, the, of Christ even a long time ago because that generation will, will, will obviously pass. But there was a statement Jesus made in, in, in Matthew, which I want us to look at. That was in the, part, the parable of the fig tree in Matthew chapter 24, verse 32 and 33. He said, now learn the parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and for the fourth leaves, you know that summer is night. So likewise, ye, when you shall see all these things, know it is near even at your doors. So that, that's, that statement is suggesting to us that Jesus saying, when these signs are being fulfilled, it is an indication that what he has prophesied is close at hand. So if we wanted to attribute these things to our times, it would mean then that if we were seeing all of these signs as indicators, Jesus' coming should have been really close at hand as this passage in Matthew indicates. But my belief is Jesus was speaking 
in relation to the people living at that time, he was using the parable of the fig tree as an illustration. He says, as you can tell when summer is coming, you can tell by certain signs which, in the, which are indicated by the, the whole fig tree experience. You know that summer is drawing near because you, you observe certain things about the fig tree. Just like we observe that when Christmas is coming close, the poinsettia starts to, to, to change its color. We notice certain signs about things in nature that give us an indication of a particular season that is coming. So Jesus was just drawing us as an illustration and saying the same way you can predict that a time is coming when you observe certain changes in, in the natural phenomena. You can, you can also know that when you begin to see these signs, that the end is drawing close. And Jesus gave a number of signs, which we indicated, and I said, what we will do tonight is to show briefly, because we cannot go into all the detail, because this is a lot of, of historical records. I will just summarize some things that would be relevant historically to show you how these things have been fulfilled. And then we are going to, to look at some of the difficult passages which I told you are in Matthew that cause a lot of um, misunderstanding and misinterpretation. We will examine these passages and compare them with Old Testament references because as I indicated to you last week, Jesus was drawing references from the Old Testament because the Jews would have been familiar with that literature and they would have understood what some of those things meant. So this is why I, I, I would want to, to show you that, that you, you understand that, that there is a link to the Old Testament when you are trying to interpret what Jesus was saying in some of these difficult passage, passages in Matthew chapter 24. Now we indicated that Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 17. And there were certain things that Jesus gave as a build up to the time drawing near. It says that there were here wars and rumors of wars. We explained that there were indeed rumors of wars and a lot of wars and conflicts experienced by the Jews with the Romans and even among themselves. They had civil conflicts. And, and Jesus was making reference to that. He mentioned about the armies surrounding Jerusalem and that they should to escape before that happened. And they, and they did escape. They took the words of Jesus seriously. And I am saying if, if they understood that the prophecy that Jesus um, was making were connected to, to their times, then you know it's, it's problematic if we see those same prophecies connected to our time because then it means that, that Jesus will not have been prophesied accurately. But those things were relevant to those times and they, they understood it. And so the, the Christian Jews obeyed what Jesus said, and they escaped to the uh, city across the Jordan River. And as a matter of fact, the, the record indicates that there was a mountain range of three and a half miles from that city. I remember Jesus was telling them to escape Judea and flee to the mountains. And they actually did go to, to the mountainous region as they crossed the Jordan. And it is said that even when Jerusalem became desolate and it was destroyed, that there was a thriving um, Christian community in that area for about 70 years. They survived there. They, they were spared the wrath and the judgment that transpired in Jerusalem. Remember we said that, that the campaign by Titus was cut short because he went back to, to after the, the emperorship in, in Rome after Nero had died. And chances are, if he had remained there longer and the campaign had continued, he would have perhaps sought out those same Jews that escaped, those Jewish Christians, and then across the Jordan. And perhaps he might have brought some of the, that same comfort into their lives. But they were spared from that. So this is the concept of the elect being spared because of the days shortened. They were able to exist in, 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 in peaceful way because they escaped Jerusalem as Jesus indicated. So Jesus indicated that there be false prophets. And in our times, yes, we can say that there has been a rise of false prophets. We have many of them, including Koresh, including Jim Jones. And I think they said within the last century, there, there could have been a, perhaps a 
34 persons that indicated they were Christ or they were, were, were the Messiah. And, and that's why people will be inclined to connect what Jesus is saying at all times. But the reality is that if you read the, the recorded account of Josephus, he indicated a number of false prophets which arose. And we also have some illustration in the book of, of Acts of, of some of these false prophets which arose. But of course, the book of Acts did not give you um, large scale detail, but there are a few that I want to mention. I don't think that we have a slide for them. Um, so you just make the reference to your, your Bible, and I hope that you can still keep your Bibles with you that you can online some of these things, because some of the texts will come up on screen, but not all, not all of the texts will. There's a passage in Acts chapter 5, verse 36. It says, For before those days rose up Judas, boasting himself to be somebody to whom a number of men, 400, joined themselves, who were slain, and as many as obeyed him were scattered and brought to naught. And then in verse 37, it says, After this, another man arose called Judas of Galilee in the days of retaxing and drew much people away after him. He also perished, and even as many as obeyed him were dispersed. Then Acts chapter 21, verse 38, spoke of an Egyptian who had a, a fallen of 4,000 men, which he led into the desert. And, and, and again, he was also claiming to be a Messiah. And then we had Simon Magus, who was the one who wanted to, to, to buy the Holy Spirit or pay to, to have the gift of the Holy Spirit. He himself also had a large following, and he drew a lot of people away after him, claiming that he was the Christ. And there were some followers, um, you know, who, who believed in him, and who had a tremendous amount of confidence in his magical works and the things that he demonstrated. And, and so we, we had a lot of illustration from, from Josephus of, of a number of persons that came up and were working magical tricks and those things that deceived a whole lot of people and, and were indeed false prophets. So he, he testified to the fact that, that what Jesus was saying was actually experienced in, in that period of time that Jesus was describing. So there was wars and rumors of wars. There, there, there was were false prophets, there, there was famine. As a matter of fact, even before, before Titus actually came to invade the city, a lot of, of, of issues were going on in, in, in Judea itself, in Jerusalem, in the city, which led to a, a lot of famine and a lot of diseases. And as a matter of fact, before um, Titus actually came and, and invaded the, the, the city, there, there was a lot of conflict that caused a lot of death. And they were saying that just as many people died from civil war and conflict among the Jews themselves, than even what was inflicted uh, on them by Titus. But there was great distress in, in that time. As a matter of fact, uh, Josephus indicated that there were about 1.1 million people that, that died over that period of time in, in that conflict that took place in, in Jerusalem. I remember Jesus had also prophesied that a number of them would be scattered, carried away in bondage. And Josephus did come in on the fact that about 900,000 of the Jews were led away by the Romans and taken into slavery and were scattered through a lot of the, of the Gentile nations. So we can confirm from the historical record that the prophecies identified by Jesus did actually take place. And they were all within the time period that Jesus was speaking about. And we indicated that the first Roman invasion took place around AD 63 by Pompey. Then Titus came in AD 70. So if we were even dealing that seven year period that people have been talking about a seven year tribulation, not that this is what the Bible is saying, but you can even examine that historically because a lot of, of the distress um, took place in, in, that, in that city from that period onwards. So between 63 AD and 70, you can see that that 
in a seven year period of, of real trial and suffering and, and distress for the people of Judea, for the city, and, and for, for that generation. So we can conclude then, yes, in fact, Jesus was speaking to that generation. And, and, he, and he did say all these things, all these things, not some, all of these things will come to pass and this generation will see them. And they indeed did see them because Jesus would have been crucified in AD 33. And what he prophesied that took place in AD 70 would have been less than a generation. That would have been at least um, 40, less than 40 years after Jesus would have made the prophecy and taken a generation of often seen at a 40 year period. Yes, that generation did see the signs. We try to discount the fact that some people say the generation refers to the generation living at the time of Christ's um, turn, because we look at other passage, passages where Jesus spoke of this generation, and we saw specifically that he was speaking to the generation at that time. And there was no argument or debate that that generation was one for the future. Many of them accepted that he was speaking to that generation. So then we have to conclude that that is precisely what he meant when he said that generation of that time. Now let's look at some of the difficult verses because there are some difficult verses. Matthew chapter 24, verses 29 to 31 is one of those difficult verses. That says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Now, some interpreters argue, well, that did not happen. So if that did not happen, it is obvious then that Jesus could not have been referring to this as an event that will take place in what he had described in his prophecy. So we have to be looking for that in, in sometime in the future because the sun wasn't darkened, the moon um, did not go out, the stars did not fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven were not shaken. But that's true because it was not meant to be taken literally. This is, a, a, again, another way of, of, of prophetic expression. It's, it's using this type of language to speak of something which is very, very, very significant. Now, let's compare that with some Old Testament passages. You understand that Jesus was speaking in prophetic language and using the literary expressions that were, that were used by the prophets of the Old Testament. One of these is Isaiah, and we're going to look at a passage from Isaiah chapter 13, Verse 9 and 10. And Isaiah here was speaking of the destruction of Babylon. Just as Jesus was speaking prophetically of the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, Isaiah was here speaking of a destruction as well. So this is, is, is apocalyptic literature. It is, it is prophetic literature very often used when God is speaking about destruction that is coming to a nation. So this is what Isaiah said in relation to Babylon. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners therein out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellation thereof shall not give their light. Sound familiar? The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. Therefore, I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts, and in the day of his fierce anger. Now, was the earth removed out of its place? Did the stars fall from heaven? Did this constellation cease to give their light? Did the moon cease to shine? No. The people in Babylon did not express any of these things, but yet the prophecy came to pass, and Babylon was destroyed. Here's another. Another passage from Ezekiel, 
referring to the destruction of Egypt, Ezekiel chapter 32, 6 to 8. It says, I will also water with thy blood the land wherein thou swimmest, even to the mountains, and the river shall be full of thee. And when I put thee out, I will cover the heaven and make the stars thereof dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give her light. And the bright lights of heaven will I make dark over thee, and set darkness upon the land, says the Lord. See the literature, Ezekiel, speaking of the destruction of Egypt. Isaiah, speaking of the destruction of Babylon. They're using the same language that Jesus used here in the book of Matthew. Yet these things came to pass in Babylon. They came to pass in Egypt. But none of these things literally took place. So it was, it was language that was being used. It was a sort of a form of hyperbole. It was exaggerated and, and, and using the, the elements of, of, of the heavens as an indication of how, of how serious a destruction would take place. It is defining the nature of the destruction. And that's why these words are being used. Now look at the passage in Revelation, which might be very well connected to the same sort of destruction that would take place in, in Jerusalem because remember I indicated that part of Revelation has been interpreted by, by many scholars to be referring to the destruction of, of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. And in Revelation 6, 12 to 14, John using that sort of literature said, and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal and lo, there was a great earthquake sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell onto the earth, even as a fig tree casts her untimely figs, when she is shaken with a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll, when it is rolled together, and every island and mountain were moved out of their places. Same sort of, of comparative literature used. And, and many theologians indicate that a large percentage of, of the symbolism and the language used in Revelation is, is taken from the Old Testament. A lot of, of the, the similar language and expressions and symbols were taken from the Old Testament. So the point that I'm making here is that this is figurative language. And it was not meant to be taken literally. So to think that the, the signs would not have been realized because we're looking for them literally is, is a misrepresentation and a misunderstanding of the intent of, of the messages that were given. There's another one here which I want to read for you from Isaiah chapter 34. And Isaiah was speaking again of another place that was being judged by God, that's Edom. And in his expression, he said, and all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, same language that we just saw there, Revelation, and all the hosts shall fall down, meaning the hosts of the, of the heavens shall fall, as a leaf falleth from the vine, and as a fallen fig from the fig tree, same thing that I was just reading from Revelation. And my sword shall, shall bathe thee in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea or Edom. So you see a similar type of language used. So the understanding that we need to get from this, and this is why it is important we, 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 we do a proper hermeneutics. One of the, the principles we identified is, is that you look at Old Testament you make comparisons with the literature. You let scripture help interpret scripture because that's the way we have to understand the word. And it, it then enlightens us as, as to the intent of, of, of the person doing the speaking. So that passage, even though it might appear to be difficult, I will give an indication that Christ could have been speaking about the future to come he actually was indeed just speaking of how serious the destruction would take place on Jerusalem. And he was using the same sort of figurative expression as was used by the Old Testament prophet. Now, 
Glenn Brother indicated, he was the one who spoke to the prophets. They often used to say, the word of the Lord came to me from. So, so even the language that they use is language that would have been given to them and inspired in, in their spirit by, by Jesus himself. All right, so we look at another passage that will appear um, to be difficult. Matthew chapter 24, verse 30. That follows from what we were just reading. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now, it is easy to see how you would, you would you could project that further down in time. And you shall see the Son of Man coming that the tribes of earth shall mourn and they shall see the sign of the son of man in heaven again that is figurative expression and the jews will understand uh, what that means because jesus used that that language as compared to language that was used before to help them understand what he was trying to say because they are familiar with that sort of language now let's pick up a passage that Jesus would have made in Luke chapter 23, verse 27 to 30. This would have been further down. This was coming to us, this crucifixion. And there followed a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus turning unto them said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in which they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear and the paths which never give suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills, cover us. So Jesus is, is saying to, 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 to the women who were poor, Praying when he was basically on, on his way to the cross. Don't weep for me, weep for your children, because the days are coming when you will go through distress. That, that women who are pregnant, women who are who have young children will regret the fact that they, that they had children that they have to carry through that experience. So, so so the trends of the earth mourning is not, not speaking again to a global event. Because when you see the word tribes, it very often is referring to the tribes of Israel. So it's speaking to the Jews, the Israelites. And, and other translations, rather than say tribes of the earth, they say tribes of the land, meaning specifically they're relating to the Jews of the land of Judea, the tribes of that particular land. And he is saying to them that they, they, they will mourn. And, and, and they did go through such a sorrowful experience that they were wishing that the mountains would fall on them. So, so Jesus here was also making a prophetic connection to what was going to go on in Jerusalem. So the statement here in Matthew chapter 24 verse 30 is linked to that. So we need not project it for time of the future. Then also look for what Jesus said in another passage and he was speaking to Caiaphas, the high priest. This is in Matthew chapter 26 verse 64. See, I'm drawing these references to show you how you compare scripture with scripture. And you watch the language that is used so that you then interpret what it means to give you an understanding of what you're presently dealing with in Matthew chapter 24. Jesus says here, um, to Caiaphas, so you remember that he was on the trial and Caiaphas was asking, are you really the son of God? And, and Jesus um, did not answer him because people were accusing him of, of saying that he would destroy the temple and raise it up in three days. When we see language again, they, mis they didn't misunderstood that. They took that literally, that Jesus was saying he would destroy the temple and build it back in three days. So that would have been accusing him of blasphemy because how dare you destroy this temple that is such a sacred icon in, in the eyes of the Jewish people. So before his accusers, Jesus didn't say anything. Then Caiaphas say, I adjure you in the name of the living God. 
Are these things that these people are saying to you true? Now, again, according to tradition, once Caiaphas made, made that statement, I adjure you in the name of the living God, Jesus was obligated to respond. So Jesus says, yes, you say it. But Jesus says unto him, you have said it. Nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter, watch that word very closely, hereafter, you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. That was also a statement made in Daniel in, in refer to Christ's um, glory, glorious coming um, to establish his kingdom and to reveal his, his, his purpose um, to mankind. We talk about Christ coming on, on the clouds. And, and so Caiaphas would have understood too that, that when that statement was made coming on the clouds and, and sit at the right hand, Jesus was saying to him, you are going to see a revelation of my power and my majesty soon, hereafter. You will get a revelation of what it means to see my authority and my power. Because Caiaphas is going to be part of that same Jewish experience when the, 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 the temple is destroyed. So the, the, the coming on the clouds here is not referring to Christ coming in his parousia. Remember, we, we talked about the Greek word parousia, which means the, the, the bodily appearing and the physical coming of, of, of Christ. Um, but, but that word was not used in the context of Matthew chapter 24, verse 30. But as I indicated, the Greeks had different words to, to use to represent um, different experiences. So when Christ speaks of coming, or when we see reference made to Christ coming, it does not, it does not always mean his, his parousia or his coming in, in bodily form or his final return to the earth. For example, there, there's a passage in, 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 um, in Revelation where Jesus was speaking to the church at Ephesus and he told them, unless they repent, he will come and remove their candlestick. Now, was he speaking of his physical appearance, his second coming? No, he was speaking of, of coming in judgment. So every time we see the, the, the word coming, it does not necessarily mean or, or specifically refer to Jesus' coming um, in, in terms of his return. It, it means that he's coming in power. He's coming in, in majesty. He's coming in judgment. And those are ways in which um, the, the coming is also interpreted. So I want to break at this point for a little while. And I, I guess that those were some heavy things that you have to unpack. And I, I know you'll be processing some of these things. So I'm giving you a little chance if you want to ask a question or you want to respond to anything that said so far i think i've been trying to explain before we look at, a, at another part of the same matthew discourse that is another difficult passage which i will explain and then we'll proceed to look at the, the other theme which jesus will discuss in matthew chapter 24 so you can bring that vision, which is the second theme dealing with his actual uh, return Uh, Reverend Chapman, um, Randy has a question. Yes. Randy, you can go ahead. Hey, good night, Reverend Chapman. You know, last yes. week you, you made reference to Matthew, 4, Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. Then the end shall come. I understood what you explained about that. Yes. My, mm. my question concerning this verse, though, is this relevant for the church today in spite of what you, the, the interpretation of how you would have shared it last week? This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. Does that have 
relevance for let's say today of how we preach the gospel encouraging people to follow Christ people who take it to mean um, the direct application to, to our our time I, I would not be, be hard on them interpret it that way because for example in the great commission Jesus said um, his disciples go ye into all the world he was speaking specifically to his disciples when he made that statement and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son of the Holy Spirit but we still apply that to our, our situation here and, and, and nobody really makes a fuss about that because we consider ourselves as his disciples and remember we said that we can have a specific reference made to a specific group but we can have application of, of that same text um, to our time, we can we can apply it. There's there's an appropriateness of that application. So in in the same way, people can appropriate what Jesus is saying is that that what will happen is that the gospel will reach the whole world before the end comes. And people are saying that that applies to our time, and therefore we are looking for that relevance now. That there are a lot of unreached places. As a matter of fact, they say that. According in the case that it could be about over a billion people who are considered as unreached. People don't have access to the Bible, who don't have the Bible in their language, people who are not in contact with Christians, people who have not even heard the gospel. There is a large percentage of, of ethnic groups and whatnot in our time. But the, but the reality is Jesus was making the statement in relation to his time. So the application is all right. But the, but the actual primary prophetic statement was made in reference to the people that Jesus was speaking to. And he said that that gospel will be preached in all the world. And it, and it actually was. I remember the world at that time would not be the same as our world. Population is much smaller. The countries would be much less because at that time, North America, South America, and those places were not discovered in the world. Was, was not in, in that consideration. So that would be speaking more of the Roman Empire and the places which Rome had touched and places in Africa, places in Asia, yes, and places in Europe. So the then world would have been a smaller world. And, and the fact remains is that, remember, on the day of Pentecost, read in Acts chapter 2, the Bible says that people from all nations across the earth were gathered on that day in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 souls were saved. So those people who were gathered from all across the world, as the Bible indicates, from all nations, and there was about 16 different um, ethnic groups identified, those people would have carried the gospel back to those places. Then when there was persecution in Jerusalem and the church scattered, the gospel was spread. Paul on his missionary journeys took the gospel the, the, that, that, got, that converted the, the um, that spoke to the Ethiopian eunuch who was converted, he was taking the gospel back to Ethiopia. So the reality is, is that the then, the then world, that statement was referring to the then world, that the gospel would reach all of those ethnic groups, all of those um, nations before the actual destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. And Paul bore testimony to that because Paul said, in, in Colossians, um, let me let me get a specific reference. And and in, and, in, and in Romans, he said that the gospel had reached the whole earth. The gospel had reached the ends of the earth. Colossians 1:23 and Romans 10:18. So 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 Paul confirmed and testified to that fact. He said in, in Colossians 1:23, be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard. And which was preached to every creature which is on the heaven. That's a statement made by Paul. And Romans 10 18 says, Their sound went out into all the earth, and their sounds unto the ends of the world. Speaking about the messengers of, 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 of Jesus Christ. So, yes, we, we are applying it to ourselves just like we apply the Great Commission. And we are saying that the gospel has to reach the, the end of, of the world before Christ returns. That application can be appropriate, but what I'm saying is, in, in its primary context, 
Jesus was not speaking to our time. He was speaking to their time. And he used that as one of the signs that the gospel would reach all of these ethnic groups right across um, Africa, parts of Asia, and, and Europe, different ethnic groups before the end, meaning not the end of the world, but before the end of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple. That's what Jesus was saying. So before Titus came and invaded, Paul is confirming that the gospel has spread far and wide and reached the ends of the earth, fulfilling the prophecy of Jesus. You see, Jesus' prophecy must be fulfilled. We have to realize that. And the reason why that is significant is because there are people who accuse Jesus of being a false prophet because they're saying that the things that he had prophesied are for our time. So, so, so then how could he have been saying that they were to be fulfilled in AD 70 when the theologians are saying that Jesus meant our time? So you, you really get some, some, some conflict there. So I believe that in, in primary context, Jesus was referring to that period. But as I indicate, we are saying that it is referring to our time. So we are looking for the gospel to reach all the world before Christ comes. We don't know how that would be applied in, in the context. So people are looking at it, yes, as a sign, but Jesus did not speak it directly to our time. He spoke it to their time. And, and in fact, from what Paul said, the gospel did reach the world before the end came, before Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70. The gospel has spread to the uttermost parts of the world. And that's what Jesus told them. I will give you power. You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and to the uttermost parts of the world, the ends of the world, the ends of the earth. All nations, all ethnic groups will hear the gospel. I remember a nation does not necessarily have to mean the whole of the nation. For example, if, if the, when the gospel came to, 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 to Barbados, we could say that the gospel had reached the Caribbean, because Barbados is in the Caribbean. We could say that it had reached Barbados. For example, when our church was established in 1912, it started in Malaporta. It had reached Barbados, but, but still it didn't reach St. Philip or, or other, those other parts till later. So I'm saying that when, when the word speaks of the gospel reaching all the nations, it does not have to necessarily mean across the whole of the country. It can reach a particular country, a particular ethnic group, and be considered as that part of the world so that the gospel did reach, as Jesus indicated, all parts of the world before the temple was destroyed in 8070. So that's, that's my long answer to that. So I hope it, it explains um, clearly to you what, how I see that. It was a direct reference to, to those people, but, but, but I believe that's where we are making the application. But it was not directly spoken to our time. It was directly spoken to, to that time, which the Apostle Paul confirmed. You have another um, question here, Reverend John. Williams. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. I believe it's from Matthew uh, 24, 30. And the person is yes. asking, yes. can you clarify the explanation of verse 30? If it is not the physical coming, then to what specifically does it refer? It refers to his coming in judgment. The, the sign of, of, of judgment. Or I'll, I'll give you a passage I'll read. From, from Joel. And Peter, Peter used this on the day of Pentecost and said that Joel was given a sign of something that was to happen in the future. Remember on the day of Pentecost, he said that what they were experiencing was spoken by the prophet Joel. And, and Joel said, and it shall come to pass I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. The old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also your servants and upon your handmaidens. In those days, will I pour my spirit. Now, we, we, we normally look at this as something that happened in the future, that God will pour his spirit. And we often quote that in the future. But Peter is actually saying that what they were experiencing on the day of Pentecost was prophesied by Joel. So they were actually experiencing something that was happening at their time. And Joel said, and it will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fur, 
and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness. Watch the language again. The moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be delivered as the Lord have said and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. So Peter, in interpreting that, used a, a, a word that says that that was a sign. So when you say the sign of the Son of Man coming, it's a sign of, of Christ coming in judgment. It's an indication that, that, that the, the power and the presence of the Lord is revealed in a form of judgment. He's coming to judge, just that he said to the church at Ephesus, I will come and remove your candlestick," state, meaning that he will come in judgment if they don't repent. So, so his indicating here about his coming and seeing the Son of Man appear and he tries morning is not speaking to his physical coming. It's speaking to a coming in judgment, the term which has often been used in the Old Testament in referring to the judgment of, of Christ. And there was another reference where he was speaking also of coming on the cloud, riding on the cloud, and speaking of a judgment of, a, of another nation. And it was not speaking of his coming in a physical form, but he did not come in a physical um, way. So it is a reference to the coming of, of judgment. Again, it's, it's, a, it's a figurative expression. Same thing he meant to, to Caiaphas. You shall see the sign of the Son of Man sitting on his throne in heaven. And he again was speaking of the sign that would, would show that he has actually inflicted what he said he would on the, the children of, of, of Judah. As a matter of fact, Titus himself even admitted, he said when he looked at the destruction, this was his own testimony, he said that all of that devastation could not be attributed to him. It had to be attributed to the God who, who had brought judgment on his own, on his own people. When he saw Jerusalem, the devastation that it was in. And, and, and Jesus didn't literally come, but his judgment came. That's why he said to the daughter of Jerusalem, you are going to mourn. And you're going to go mourn for me. And he was actually speaking of, of that time that he would bring destruction. And remember, God has often used, I think I looked to you before, Gentile nations to bring judgment on the children of Israel. Syria, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Romans. So, so that that's how that passage can also be interpreted. All right, another another difficult reference that that, that was made is when Jesus says that you shall not see anything like this before, or you have not seen anything like this before, nor, nor seen this after. So some people concluded that it could not have been then the destruction of Jerusalem because we have had worse things that came after that, because of course of the Jews um, in being afflicted by Hitler. So what took place at the destruction of Jerusalem could not have been worse than that. So then if Jesus made a statement to indicate that, that it is not the worst thing that could happen that you, that, that you will not see, that you will see something worse than that afterwards, they were concluding that it could not have been referring to that time. But again, this is language that has been used before in relation to, for example, what happened in Egypt, Exodus chapter 10, verse 14. It says, and locusts went up over all the land of Egypt arrested in all the course of Egypt. Very grievous were they before them were no such locusts and neither after them shall be such. In other words, he's saying you ain't see anything like this before and you don't want to see it again. The sort of language that he was using there in relation to Jerusalem to show how devastating it would be. Again, it's, it's not to be taken literally to say that 
this is the worst thing that could ever happen. You didn't say anything before, you didn't say anything after. So therefore, Jesus could not have been accurately speaking about Jerusalem because we saw things that happened worse than that. We saw millions of people die in, in, in the Second World War. We saw millions of Jews um, being put in the gas chamber. And only about 1.1 million, I indicated before, would have been killed in, in, in the Jewish conflict. But you see, that's why it's important that we understand language and terminology. So the statement I made earlier, when I made reference to Jesus saying to the Jews that you, they will not see him afterwards until they say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. So the premillennialists took that to mean that's a future statement referring to the salvation of the Jews in large numbers and that Christ will not return until they come to that place where the acknowledgement is set and they get saved. But again, Jesus was drawing reference from an Old Testament passage from in Psalms 118, I think, verse 26. It's a psalm that, that used to be sung. Blessed is he that cometh in the, in the name of the Lord when they were going to special feasts, like the Feast of the Passover, the Feast of, of Tabernacles, or the Feast of Pentecost. As they, as they came up to Jerusalem, that's a song that they used to sing as a psalm. And Jesus is saying to them, yes, you're going to see me again. And you're going to see me at the same time that you're saying that psalm. And as a matter of fact, Jerusalem was destroyed at the time of the Passover. That, that's when Titus came and attacked Jerusalem. He came in April at the time of the Passover and, and when the city was surrounded for, for several months. And then the destruction came upon them in, in around the time of August. So, so Jesus was drawn a parallel to that. During the Passover, when they would have been going up, he said the same psalm blesses he that cometh in the name of the Lord. That's when they saw. And saw again was not a literal seeing. They will see his judgment. They will see his hand upon them, a heavy hand of judgment. So you see, we must understand the language. We must get the context. And we do that by making comparisons. So here in Exodus, Jesus said the locust was the worst. They have not seen anything like that before. And they will not see anything afterward. But yet in a passage in Joel, speaking about locusts, the same statement was made. There was not anything before that, nor anything after that, that that you will see that will be as bad. So, so then is, is, is the Bible telling lies? No, these, these are figurative expressions that are used. There's another one here in, in Second, King, Second Kings, I think I would have made reference to that last week. Said, speaking of Hezekiah, he trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah nor any that were before him. And then you read in 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 25, and like unto him, this is speaking of Joseph, and like unto him was there no king before him that turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his might, according to the law of Moses, neither after him would any arise like him. You see the language? So here you're saying of Hezekiah, there's nobody before nor will not come like him afterwards. And then just a less than in a generation after you see Joseph appearing on the scene, and the same language is used is none before him or none like after him. So Hezekiah would have been before him. It's language, figurative expression. So you, you've got to take that into context and understand that those things are not to be taken literally. Or if you if you if you take them literally, in, it would appear that that, that that Bible is um is is lying. You see, as, um, as people stumble on hyperbole, and as I explain to you, these are forms of hyperbole. They, they are they are expressions, they are exaggerations to make a point of, of the type of person that the was, the type of person Joseph was, the, the type of pandemic that was experienced in the plague of locusts, the, 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 the type. Of, 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 of an experience. See, it is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is an exaggeration. It is hyper, hyperbole, not meant to be taken literally. I gave you some examples of, of that last week, and it is often a, a form of expression used in the Bible. 
See, so we, we have to take the language in the context and the expressions to understand what the, the word is saying, or else we could end up with an interpretation which is not the intent of the writer or the author, but it is what it appears to be to us, how we are interpreting in our experience, in our understanding, and, and not using the language that was used at the time and that those people would have understood in the context of which it was used. So we have, we have to bear that in mind. All right, so I repeat. So then all the signs that Jesus identified in Matthew chapter 24, some of them I told from Luke, because they said Luke gave a little more detail because he talked about the Gentiles being trodden, Jerusalem being trodden, not the Gentiles. He talked about them being carried away um, as, as, as slaves in, in other people's territories, and that actually happened. We, we saw the spread of the gospel, the army surrounding Jerusalem, um, because iniquity with a, with a bound love of many shall wax cold. We saw um, brothers betraying one another, children, against parents and parents against children, and distress um, in, in, the, in the, the nation that was, was really unparalleled. It, it was a devastating experience. And Josephus gave some graphic details, and if you want to get more details, you can read um, the, the wars, wars, Jewish wars written by, by, by Josephus. I remember I told you that it's important sometimes to get full information because you do not always get the full details um, in, in, in the Bible itself. Because Josephus always also recorded of, of, of the priests being killed in the temple. Remember, Jesus talked about the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel. And the temple actually went through abomination. The Titus killed many priests that were offering sacrifices in the temple. They set up um, emblems of, of Roman authority of symbols and they worshiped pagan deities in the temple. That was the abomination. And, and Josephus said that the blood flowed in the, in the city. And this is perhaps what Joel Vicky referenced to me. He talked about the sign of blood and fire and smoke. Lots of blood they were in the city. So people believe that, that Joel, in that part of the prophecy, was speaking to what happened in Jerusalem. The smoke ascending was the temple being burnt to the ground. Not one stone left standing upon the other. Even where there were stones, the, the, the Romans actually separated them, pulled everything down flat to the ground, just as Jesus had prophesied. People who tried to escape Jerusalem. That's why he just told them before the Romans get there and you got the chance to escape, do that. People that didn't take the word seriously and remain tried to escape. And, and many of them got killed. Some of them paid bribes, escaped the city. And, and people were swallowing coins that if they were able to escape, they would have money that they would be able to use if they, if they got out. And, and the Roman soldiers, when they realized that, they, they started to cut them open and, and take out the coins. So you, you, could, you could really imagine why such hyperbole would have been used to refer to what went on in Jerusalem. It was a tragic and devastating experience. And as I said, that's why Titus would have said, God had to be in that. That could just be about him. And indeed, God would bring judgment on those people. And Jesus has said to them, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I, 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 I would have gathered you as a hen, gathered chicks. He, he went over Jerusalem because he knew what was coming. And they did not take the, 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 the time to be saved. And, and in John chapter 12, he said to them, you had the light with you. And you did not accept the light, but darkness is going to come on you. So when, when you hear references to the, the moon not giving her light and the constellations falling, what Jesus is saying is that darkness is going to come on you. You had the light. Because notice that all the forms that the word was using, the moon, the sun, the stars, the constellations in heaven, light. And Jesus was the light of the world. And they rejected that light. And Jesus told them so in John chapter 12. You had the light right in your presence. And you refused to accept the light. But darkness is going to come. So that's a figurative expression. It was really a dark period in the history of, of Jews. And it brought an end to that era. And now Jesus is, is sending out his messengers. 
his angels that are going up are his messengers to establish the, the gospel and proclaim the light that the Jews failed to, to, to do. They were supposed to be light to the Gentile nations and allow the, 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 the gospel to reach the Gentiles through them. They rejected the Messiah. So an end was brought to their period, and the church now is that agent that is transferring the light. The church meaning both Jew and Gentile, because remember, Jews got saved and were part of the church. Those that were far off, that the Gentiles were made night, and we become one in Christ. There's no Jew and Gentile, now there's a church. And we are, as Peter says, our priests and heirs. We are the chosen generation. We are the royal priesthood that we may show forth the praises of him who have called us out of darkness in his marvelous light. That was the, the temporary purpose of the Jews which they fell away short of and now a termination to that era. And a new era has been opened up. Judgment was brought to Judaism, the Jews and that system and the new covenant opened up a new way, a new experience. And it's the church that represents no spiritual Israel that is carrying that light to the world that Jesus had commanded his disciples. Okay, we pick up. Before you go ahead, Pastor Chapman. Yes. Um, well, I had a query, but before I do that, um, Peter Earl had made a comment with, with regard to the same abomination of desolation. I um, just want to clarify if. Um, the response that was given is okay with you, Peter? The abomination of desolation, you said? Now, he had a query with regard to the abomination of desolation just around the same time that you spoke, started speaking about it. So I just want to know if he was okay with your response. Yes, good night, everyone. Yes, mm -hmm. I, I, I um, understood what you were saying. But I wanted to add a, a bit more to it. Somebody said that yes. Jesus would have spoken that uh, would have spoken 200 years after this abomination of the desolate you 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 think that was so that he was spoken 200 years after that yeah no, that, 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 that could not have been accurate because all of these mm -hmm. things Jesus said before he was crucified remember he spoke them in temple he left the temple and left him out of olives and continued speaking and he took his disciples privately and said and said those things to him all of what you see here in matthew chapter 25 was spoken before jesus was even crucified remember you read the part there where he was telling you women you're praying for me but don't pray for me read for your children mm -hmm. because the days are coming and he was speaking about the destruction of jerusalem so so that 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 particular um um interpretation to me cannot be accurate not according to what we are reading here in, in the bible Jesus is making this prophecy before he was actually crucified. Um, on that point, then, so there would not have been any reference to the quote uh, abomination of desolation at any point before Jesus made that statement. He said, "Where you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, stand in the holy place." That's in the same Olivet discourse. Right. That's as I remember. Yeah. That. So when you see it, stand in holy place. Who shall stand in holy place? He that have clean hands and a pure heart. When you see that begin to happen, it is like you, you better make it right with God. You better stand, you better get your place. Because the Christian Jews left, but there are a lot of Jews that remain. But but Jesus was still saying that even in that devastation. You, you can stand in the place that you need to stand. So he he, he was speaking um, before his crucifixion. So that could not have been a statement made hundreds of years after. All right, man. What I think we'll be suggesting then is that the idea of it being spoken 200 years before may link back can, to... Can you speak a little louder, please? Can you speak a little louder? I was saying that the... Since Daniel would have mentioned it before Jesus did, that yes. might coincide with that 200 year claim that was being made. Well, remember when Daniel was was, make, was making that statement, he would he would have been making a prophecy looking into time. 
which will not have happened yet. And we, and we said, yes, there, there, there was um, a Syrian ruler called uh, Antiochus IV who came to Jerusalem. And he also brought devastation and desolation in the city. So people say that perhaps Daniel could have been making reference to him. And Antiochus, as I said to you, um, brought desolation by offering sacrifice of pigs on the altar and stealing some of the, of the money from the treasury in the temple. That was 167 BC. That was before Christ um, actually came. But if Jesus is making reference to what Daniel spoke, obviously he's, he's drawn a link between the abomination that is going to come in Jerusalem and what, what um, Daniel spoke. So while people say yes, that Daniel could have been speaking of, of, of Antiochus Epiphanes, he could also have been speaking of, of Titus, the prince that was to come, in the reference that Daniel would have made that would bring desolation in, in the temple. And if Jesus had drawn that parallel and that reference, chances are that is what Daniel could have been referring to, and that his prophecy would be several, several years before it actually happened. Okay, uh, I think that might have pretty much covered it, right, Peter? Yes, yes, that, that would cover it for now, yes. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, Mike, right. read, um, yes, sorry, go ahead. With regard to, because you would have mentioned uh, Josephus last week as well as this week, um, with regard to his reporting on the destruction of Jerusalem. Yes. There have been any other accounts um, that would coincide with what he would have said there. There was there was one of the Jewish fathers, but you see why why Josephus is a, is important is because Josephus was alive at that time. He, he is a, a, a witness to those things. And and the account that he would have written would have been an account based on a witness account. So other people would have responded to what Josephus would have said that like Eusebius, but Eusebius came after Josephus. So he would have been drawn on some of the things that, that Josephus would have said. And Eusebius was one of the early church fathers. But, but he would not have been a first hand witness. So he would have been drawn on account or records that would have been given. And he made reference to Josephus. I think there was another writer called Pliny. But, but we have to take what Josephus wrote because he was an eyewitness. There might have been other writers that wrote from experiences that would have been handed down to them or information that they might have researched. But Josephus is taken as the main person and most of the references made to that are taken from Josephus because it's, it's, it's a eyewitness account. He was there, he experienced it. I ask a question because um, well, for example, you would have mentioned um, the whole issue of hyperbole. So yes. you may be wary of if because it was... But, but Josephus was using hyperbole. If it's possible. Right. Um, additionally, there have been suggestions that that whole eyewitness account might have been a forgery. Um, so if it is possible that there would have been other persons, even possibly on the other side for, from the Romans, who would have been there if they had recorded it? Um, that's why I was wondering if there were any similar records on, from other persons. You know, to I validate. Haven't come, I, haven't, I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't come across anybody, but I will have to check Herodotus because he was a historian as well. And, and Herodotus usually records a lot of that ancient history. And I, have, I will have to check to see if he made references to that, but I haven't seen. Um, I, I think what you're saying would be important if you check other accounts, maybe from the Roman perspective, and see if, if Josephus might not have been exaggerating. But remember, if, 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 if Josephus was exaggerating, Jesus would have been exaggerating too. Because Jesus used some statements there, which speaking of, of a lot of distress, and I, I am saying is that even if you were to think that Josephus was using hyperbole, I am saying that the, the language used by, by Jesus would have to be speaking of things that actually occurred. 
he didn't he didn't give exact numbers. We got that from Josephus. That's when say extra biblical information sometimes um, is important because it gives details that were not given in, in the Bible. And there are a lot of details about what happened. I'm just explaining some of them to you that were not given. But the fact remains is that the prophecies that were given by Jesus were, were actually fulfilled. Understood. Thank you. But, but I would I would check to see that if there are some other sources and see what accounts have been given. But I I, I I don't believe that that Joseph was by the using hyperbole. I believe that he's giving specific references because remember he said that a lot of people even quote from Josephus, and he he was a very respected historian, very much respected. And he was he was very religious too, even even though he might have had issues with, with Christ being the Son of God and, 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 and the deity himself. Josephus was very very um, religious. Okay. Which, which yeah. done, does not necessarily mean that that some of his statements, because he's religious, may not be exaggerated. Because we had people who who said they were religious, but you know, still still had issues with them. But Constantine. Constantine said he was converted, he was a Christian, but there were still issues um, surrounding Constantine. But jo Joseph was a very trusted uh, historian, and you could take seriously what he says. I want to pick up if you didn't have more questions. Uh, one more, start. apparently, that uh, Peter has another query. Yes. Sorry, sorry about that, Reverend Jackman. Um, no, it's all right. It's quite all right. That's what we're here for. We got time. Yes, I just varied off a bit. Yeah. With all that is happening now. No, all yeah. that's happening in the world now. How do you see it fitting into this Matthew 24 or, or Revelation? Any other prophecies that how, how, how would you see it fitting into this? Now, as I indicated previously, when you're interpreting prophecies, you have what you call the primary um, fulfillment, which means that it's specific purpose, the specific time, the specific reference to a particular people group or place or individual. But sometimes what happens is that you can have what is referred to as a secondary prophecy, which means that you could you could you could have an application of it that could occur at another time in the future. But, but the thing about that is as I said, if you have the primary fulfillment, that is what counts the most. So I'm saying that in what in relation to what Jesus had predicted, there was a primary fulfillment, right as he said, and in every detail there was. But some theologians say that you can have what you call a secondary application, which means that you can see, as people say, history repeating itself. And that's what they would call a secondary application of a prophecy, that that, that that prophecy could in some way be repeated in the future. And I am saying that I would not be hard pressed on that particular position. In other words, if theologians say that it could be a secondary application because we see these things even happening in our times, wars and rumors of wars have indicated, famine, earthquakes, diseases, um, nation rising against nation and things of, of, of that nature, false prophets coming up. And, 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 and you could see how it, it ties in with what Jesus said, because the specific items of prophecy we are seeing unfold before us. So I am saying, yes, there's a possibility that they could have a second application. Now, history always don't repeat itself. People say so, but that's not always the case. But if, if theologians say that there could be a possibility that we could see a parallel to that, I would not condemn that particular interpretation or that 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 perspective of it. But remember, you talk theological theological perspectives. I will not condemn that. What I'm saying is that we have a primary application, a primary fulfillment. That's why I hold it there because I will have to wait until the others unfold to know that they are true. We have evidence that what Jesus already said is true, but I will now have to wait, and we will all have to wait, even though we see signs. Uh, it means that we will have to wait to see the gospel spread to all parts of the world 
and then we are going to connect the coming of Christ to that. Then we are also going to be connecting the coming of Christ to the Jews becoming Christians. We're going to connect the coming of Christ to the Jews rebuilding their temple and going back to temple worship. We're going to connect the, the, the coming of Christ to a, a, a whole lot of things. And, and then what will happen is that we start making predictions. And that's why we wanted to get on the second team. We don't want to do that late. No, we'll have to start that uh, in, in, the, in the next session. Where you see that Jesus do not give any signs at all that you can predict in relation to his coming. Now remember, he had two questions asked. We indicated we've got to keep that in our minds foremost. The first one related to the destruction of the temple. That's why the disciples asked him, when will these things happen? Jesus answered that question. And then they asked him, what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the world? And Jesus answered that question. And in that part, which we will look at, now, you will realize that the tone is different. And we will make a comparison between the, the first team and the second team, and you will see that there's a remarkable difference in how he answers that, that question. And there are no specific signs given in that answer, which means, as I was indicating, that those signs that were mentioned were specifically related to the destruction of Jerusalem and not to the coming of Christ not prior to the coming of Christ. We want to connect them because that's what our interpretation is. Remember I said that premillennialists say that Jesus answered the second question first, meaning that he was answering the question about his return first. So that's why they link all of those signs to coming events that will precede the return of Christ in the world. I say no. Jesus answered the first question first and the second question second. And that's why I drew your attention. Please read Matthew, sorry, Mark 13 and Luke 21 and see that they, they only asked the answer the second question. Mark gave a little part, um, sorry, the first. Mark gave a little part in the response of the second question. But in, in part, they only recorded the first question, which means that all of what was recorded in those books are referring to the destruction of Jerusalem. So I am saying, I am not looking for those as signposts based on what Jesus has said. Possibility that we could see some of these things happening before Christ's return? Sure, the possibility exists. But my interpretation, my analysis, says that Jesus made those statements in relation to the destruction of Jerusalem, and that happened. You will see in the second thick part of, of the, the answer that he just used parables and speak more about our preparation for his return and not looking at signs of his return. He, he, he's, and, the, and, and we're going to see that very clearly as how Jesus answered that question. And that's why we want to signs were specifically related to that time. But if we want to draw a parallel and say there's a possibility that these things could be preceding his return. We have often preached that, as I said, I have preached sermons using some of these same things as, as signs. Watch how many earthquakes we are having. Watch how many wars we, we are having. Because I was drawn into that particular perspective until I, as I said, had a, a deeper understanding that they were specifically related to a different time period. But could there be a parallel? There's a possibility. Could there be a dual prophecy? There could be a possibility, but Jesus never said that in his reply to the second question. He never gave us these indicators as signposts. They were given to the first, and, and, and that is what he would have to, to form my, my primary um, interpretation on. So that's where I would stand in relation to those, Peter. I can't say uh, specifically that there are signs that Jesus identified as, as prior to his coming. But does the possibility exist that some of these things could arise and that they could be indicators that his coming is near? Possibly. But that was not what Jesus intended when he made the prophecy. Good night, Pastor. Okay, so that's a question coming? Yes, please. Okay. 
Well, not a question, a, a statement. Um, statement, I know, yeah. I, I know right now that we're at the end of, of, of the session, um, but I know for sure that prophecy has sometimes a dual meaning. Now, in the book of um, Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, it says, When Israel was a child, I have loved him, and out of Egypt I have called my son. This is um, Hosea speaking. Now, I don't yeah. think that he was that he was referring to to Jesus, he was referring to Israel, Jacob being in Egypt. But Matthew said it um, in Matthew chapter two, um, two and verse 15, he says, and Christ was there until the death of, of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, out of Egypt, I have called my son. So you have, you have Joel, sorry, you have Hosea saying something that meant something for, for Israel, and then Matthew is saying that thing might be fulfilled about Jesus. That was one. Um, there's the other one too in that situation here too. In, um, in is Matthew chapter 16 and verse 27 where it says, For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with the angels, and then he would reward each according to his works. Yeah. Verse, verse 28 says, as surely I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his glory. Uh -huh. it, interesting. But he wasn't talking about the coming in the last days. He was talking about the transfiguration, which follows shortly after. So sometimes what can happen is that we can read the Bible literally and get it wrong. Yeah. We can read it figuratively and get it wrong too. So yes. You have, not, you have to know exactly which one it is saying at the time, but at the same time, I do believe that some things that are said in the word can have a dual um, meaning. Case in point, I mentioned just now with um, with with Hosea and also with Matthew. Yes. Oh, you're you're right. You're very right. You can read it literally and get it wrong. You can read it figuratively and get it wrong. You see, because it all depends on where you apply the figurative language, what you apply um, the symbols to. It's just that people read Revelation and they have a different interpretation of the beast. When you read Daniel, Daniel used the word beast and he tells you in the, in the interpretation that the beast referred to kingdoms. But yet people will come and refer to the beast as the mark of the beast and, and the mark of the Antichrist and that's their interpretation. So yes, while you are making a figurative interpretation, you can get it wrong because you can also interpret if the, the, if the figures of speech or the symbols wrong. Now, in, in, the, in the first instance that you mentioned, and I agree with you, yes, there's a possibility of dual prophecy. Again, you've got to watch how it is interpreted and what the reference is made to. Because in, in the one of Hosea, I called my son, referring to each other Israel, you, you very often don't see the term my son being used to refer to Israelites. The, the Israelites are often referred to in, in, in the female gender, the, the, the harlot that have gone astray. And, and you, you look very, very um, often in scripture, you will see that the reference is made more often to the Jewish people in, in the female gender rather than the male gender. And, and the, the reference that Matthew was, was referring to, calling my son out of Egypt, that, that is a specific reference, yes, to Jesus. Because remember, Jesus as a, as a baby had to flee from Herod and he was sent to Egypt. And after Egypt, after Herod died, then he was recalled from Egypt and he came and he lived in Nazareth. So he did not remain in Egypt. So you can see the specific reference to that calling out of Egypt, that is really directly referring to Jesus coming out and not, not Israel as a nation. I can see that. Then the reference with, um, there are some of you standing here, here which shall not taste of death till you see um, me coming in, 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 in my kingdom. Again, it's how you interpret the symbols. Now, the premillennials interpret that to me that the kingdom of God has not come yet. Because Jesus says, there are some of you standing here who will not taste of death until you see me coming in my kingdom and in, in, in glory. So that is their interpretation to say that the kingdom of God has not come yet, but if that is to be taken literally, you're going to have problems because Jesus says 
there are some of you who are standing here who will not taste of death until you see my kingdom come in, in fullness. So if you're waiting for the kingdom to come in the future, maybe you've got some people who are near a thousand years old. What Jesus is referring to, you said about transfiguration, but other people interpret that to mean coming on the day of Pentecost, coming in his fullness, coming to, to bring an inauguration, an empowerment to the kingdom. So, so Jesus is referring to the day of Pentecost, and he was saying to them, that some of you are going to be still alive. Then you see me coming, and again, not coming in his process, but coming in power, coming on the disciples on the day of Pentecost, still them with the Holy Spirit and in our great the empowerment of the church to, 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 to go forward to proclaim the gospel to the nation. So you see, is 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 how people interpret even the symbols and interpret the figurative language. But yes, you can have a dual application. But if you're looking for a future the application, it has it either has to be to be fulfilled at some point in time. Or if you're waiting for it to fulfill, you cannot be sure until it does happen. And if you're waiting for these signs as a future um, preload price return, then we will have to wait for them to unfold. So which one will be waiting on now? It will just be the gospel being preached to all the nation because we will have seen wars and rumors of war. And we will have seen false prophets. We will have seen earthquakes in diverse places. We've seen fanning. And pestilence all over the world, but the gospel has not yet reached all nations because there are still unrich people in our world, and we are looking for that. But remember, when Jesus gave the signs, he says, "Look at the fig tree. You can tell when the time is drawing near." And if if, if the fig tree is an indication of of, of, a, of a sign of the near coming, Jesus is saying that when you see these signs. You know that the destruction of Jerusalem can make close. So if we want to appropriate that into our time, Jesus coming will have to be really, really near. Because then all these things that we identified would have been basically fulfilled. So he's at your doorstep. He said, even at your door, meaning that it's got to be really, really close. I, I don't think we think that it's really, really close yet, because then we still got a lot of people to reach. So that is how we, I, I view that. The dual application, yes, has its place, but you, we've got to see it unfold. And we've got to take the context in which Jesus says, and if we follow it right through, then we will have to know then that we are at the doorstep of Christ's return. Maybe some people believe that, that we are at the doorstep. But there, there was a guy called Harold Campaign who look at all these signs and he made predictions and he said that that price was going to come in um, on the, the, the 31st of May 2011. And he he had a radio broadcast that went across the world and he, he, he printed sign posts and people contributed millions and millions of dollars. And when April, when May 31st came 2011, he predicted that he had it wrong and it's going to be August the 31st. Or October, and then that came away, and he had to apologize. A lot of people sold their possessions and cash in their 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 um, investments and dropped the money off their account. They believe what he said because he had the predictions locked down, and we didn't see anything fulfilled because it couldn't be because there were no signs that Jesus gave you could come and actually predict that. So we we brought to bear in mind. They say that there were no specific signs that Jesus gave the answer to the, their question in the first instance. So we will look at the second phase next week, the second theme, and see how he responds to his coming, what he does say. Vision is coming. So we will pause here for tonight. Thank you very much again for your questions and for your interaction and for your discussion and for your your opinions and your expression. That's how we learn. And we learn together. And we search the scriptures together. And I hope that you're becoming you know, really enthusiastic in studying the word and seeing how it's important to, to use the principles of interpretation that become, become better students of the word. Thank you. <laughs>